Anyway, welcome back. <laughs> Is anybody excited about the World Cup? South Korea just won. Ooh. Tomorrow's game, 9 a.m., United States versus Netherlands. Who's going to win tomorrow's game? Anybody? Uh, there, are, there are lots of models. I want your prediction. Go ahead. You can say it. Netherlands. It's all right. I think this U.S. team wants you to say that. Anyway, uh, okay, any questions for me to begin? Now here there's a homework due. Okay, got it. I'll just move on. Missing data? So today I actually have two lectures. I don't know if you noticed this, but yesterday I, I end up, I have lectures beyond today. I have missing data and empirical priors today Scale identification Monday, or Wednesday, excuse me, and then Friday I have uh, model fit. So, ooh, I got them. But I will let you know if we're going to have videos on Friday only or in person. When does, does it, South Korea doesn't play, trying to, we're trying to coordinate the World Cup here, right? Because it's 1 p.m. where these mock knockout games start to really get serious. And let's be for real, right? This class happens once every three years, and the World Cup is once every four years. <laughs> so one you need to you know, seize the advantage of. That, and nobody ever says to me, wow, you really scored a goal with how you treated missing data. Doesn't go like that, right? Wow, that was, a, that was an impressive moment. No. All right, let's do missing data. How many of you have missing data? Sweet. We will just... Teach, I'll teach you how to do it and stand at the end of this, this half lecture. I will teach you what the ramifications are mathematically. Okay? You probably care less about the ramifications than the stand part right now. Am I right? All right. You know our data. I like to put this at the front because we're still using that data. Um, so I am going to start off by, I, I have the data set that we have is full, right? It's complete data. But I'm going to make it incomplete. I'm just going to take one observation and make it missing. Now, you can make one observation missing. You can make most of them missing. The methods are still the same. Okay? And I'll go a step further because I care about you. I really do. The code that I built will work for one observation missing or all of them almost missing. Not all of them. You still have to have people. But that's it. Uh, <laughs> It will work with as much missing as you have, but observed variables have to have some values that are not missing by definition. Otherwise, philosophically, you didn't observe it. Right? Okay. So, first, first person's response to the first item is missing, the rest is complete. We have our, we're actually going to do this. I have the multi dimensional model from the last lecture. Do you remember the last lecture? How many of you love the Cholesky decomposition? First of all, anytime you teach about decomposition of anything, it's not good. Like usually when I hear that word, I think of like something returning to elemental form, like leaves or decay or whatever. But no, I'm talking about a matrix. Anyway, nobody wants to hear that. Uh, but I'm going to use the code for the multidimensional model. But I'm only going to run a unidimensional model in it, which means it's a slower unidimensional model. But I'm emphasizing a point because I care about you as people. I sound that like I'm like sarcastic. I actually do care about you. But because I really care, that multidimensional code will run unidimensional models as well too. So you could use it all for one, all right? But you know our Q matrix this time is uh, a column of ones. This, many people wouldn't even call this a Q matrix, but because that last code runs on the Q matrix, you need to run it. You could call this the dumb Q matrix, the stupid matrix. Maybe that's it. I don't know. It's not really that dumb. It's just uninteresting. Maybe that's it. The plain Q matrix. All right. So how do we make this work? I'm going to dive right into code. The key in Stan to making things work is to skip over the missing data. Right? So Stan, by default, does not model missing data. And 
depending on the types of data you have, STAM may or may not work to model the data that are missing also. More on that, well, I don't know that I have more on that, but, but this is the code that I built the last time. If you remember, we have our multinomial, multivariate normal Cholesky for theta. We have a theta correlation matrix. Now I'll note a correlation matrix with one dimension, one factor. This is not a correlation matrix. It's just a one by one matrix that contains the variance of the late variable. So this is overkill for the Cholesky, but doesn't make a difference. We're not a, not a big deal. We don't actually estimate it either. Um, okay, here's the key. Here's our data. Prior to this class, we had Y of item. It looked like this before. And now is item and then something over here in pink. That term in pink contains the cases that we're not missing. It's a list of numbers, it's, it, or just a vector of numbers. So what we're doing in computer science terms is array indexing. Have you ever heard that term before? Let me think of it this way. If we're in R, let me uh, did I show this demo. If I did, I think I did. Okay. Well, yeah, let's do that. Hang on. <laughs> I'm talking to myself, which is really what you come for. This is the content you're here for, right? So let me just go through R here. This is, this is stand the old way w without missing. So I created the missing data, and if I try to run it in stand, you, you guess what happens. Have you tried to run stand before with missing data? No? Anybody tried it? While this compiles? All right. Here's what it's going to do. Oh, hey. It's like the first thing it checks. It stands never that quick. And it's like error variable y has na values. Not a good idea, right? So we cannot give stan missing data. So here, I'll get to the syntax in just a minute. But let me just show you what ends up happening. We know that um, these conspiracy items, this, this data that we have, right here, the very first case is missing. So what Stan needs to run on, remember there's 177 people, and, we, and the, the algorithm we built loops through every item, right? What Stan needs to do for each item is not use the whole 177, that first one, it needs to use 176 people. And it actually needs not to use, it can't use the first 176, because the first 176, the very first one, is missing. It actually has to use case 2 through case 177. And so if you think about it from an R point of view, if we wanted to see only the people who were, had data, if I went and just put 2 through 177 here, you just see complete data, right? And the term right here, this number right here, two through 177, that's the index of the array. Those are the values that have data in it. So what we have to do is tell Stan not only how many people are there, how many people have observed data, but also which people have observed data. So that's where I'm building this matrix called observed. So I'm gonna build in a matrix and each column of the matrix is just going to be the set of people who have observed data for each item. Does that sound okay? So think of it this way. The other part of Stan, remember in R, 2 through 177, it's just the set of numbers, 2 up to 177. There's nothing stopping you from selecting only, let's say, 2, 7, 17, 16. If you wanted only three numbers, when you give it the values 2, 7, and 16, it returns to you case 2, which is right here, case 7, uh, wait, hold on, case 2, which is right here, case 7, uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right here, and then 16, wherever that happens to be. So, so what's happening in Stan um, is the same function. We can give it a series of integer values that will only select 
those observations where data we know is missing, is observed. Cool? This is called an array index. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, this observed matrix right here that I'm giving Stan, it's the same size as our data, right? Because think of it this way. I have one variable that has one missing value. And I have the rest of my variables where all are observed. And what this is going to contain is the set of observations that are not missing. So the very first column of this will have 176 numbers in it. But the next column will have 177. So by, by making this the same size of our data, we've made it so that there's no way that we could overrun the size of this matrix to give to Stan, right? Because if we have the case where nobody's missing, this matrix will just contain one through 177, right? So we need to fill that in, basically. So here, and I use the, 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 the number negative one on purpose. There's nothing magical about negative one, but because this is going to hold a, 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 a set of values that index the array, right? There's no negative one element. You know what I'm talking about? If I, if I go into R and I say, I want the negative one. <laughs> it doesn't know what to do when I give it negative one for an element, right? It's like, you are crazy to, to ask for that. Let me try this real quick. I should never do R examples on the fly. It's like, I don't know what you're talking about. It just gives me everything. So you can't index an array by negative one. So there's two things by starting this off at negative one that gives, gives me a visual. If I see a negative number, it's easy to see. If I go inspect this before I submit it to Stan, if I see negative there, I know it's supposed to be there. I can double check. The number two, if somehow my code is wrong and we give Stan a negative value, Stan's going to throw an error to us. So this allows us to make sure that we only select the cases that are being selected. Are you with me? All right. So what I need to do is I also need a count for each variable of how many are observed, right? So here, if I take the very first variable, set, set it equal to one, this code right here, this n observed, is going to be for each of my observed variables, how many people gave me data, okay? So it'll be 10 numbers, one for each item. And here is the code that I use to do that. There's a function called isNA. Right? This basically says if a case is missing or not. Right? It's either true or false. So that very first case is true. Uh, I don't really care for is NA. I want to know which is not NA. Right? So if I, if I put an exclamation point in front of it, it flips. Well, actually, I can't do that. But if I put that in the which function, the which function tells me which case this is applying to. Right here. So this is telling me the cases that have observed data, 2 through 177. You with me? So now I need to know how, how long that, that, how many there are there. So I use the length function. So this is 176 people. So if I, those are the 176 people that are there. So I'll just start here and observed, 176. Now I go to the very first column of my observed matrix and in spots one through 176, that's just the number I calculated before, I record the number with which was not missing, the index position in the array. Right, so what this is going to give me, these numbers, two through 177, are all the observed data for this first item. So I just need to save those in my matrix, but I need to save them in spots 1 through 176, not 1 through 177. Am I boring you to tears with this? Or are you with me? All right? So when I do that, this observed matrix starts at 2 and goes down to 177, but the very last case is negative 1. So what I'm going to tell Stan is use only the values up till that last case. So when I go into stand, it's going to take the first 
176 cases and use those values to select those cases. Cool? All right, so for the rest of this, though, when I run this loop, yeah, 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 try that again. Observed is going to be, again, fairly ridiculous. Each of the other items is complete, has complete data. So we will give Stan all 177 cases, and it'll just use the entire vector in the calculation. Questions? Going too slow here? I feel like I'm going too slow. This is like the nuance of coding rather than the nuance of statistics. But I believe coding is almost as hard as statistics in, some, in many cases, right? To do it well, at least. What's that look for? Do you disagree? No, no I don't disagree at all. I, 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 I like I disagreements. You yesterday, I feel like I'm learning like three different languages at once right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not, <laughs> I'm not an R person. I'm not an L person. I'm not a Stan person. <laughs> you are now. Um, okay. So the other thing I'm going to do, sorry about that. The other thing I'm going to do is I've got to replace the missing variable in y so that Stan doesn't say y has na values, right? So when I submit the data to it, it can't be na. So again, I'm going to pick a number that's outside the range. I know my items go from 1 to 6, or excuse, bless you, 1 through 5, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm picking negative 1 because if Stan happens to try to use negative 1 in the calculation, Remember, we have in the stand code, we have the ordered logit function, ordered logistic. It needs a value, an integer that starts at one and goes up to a finite number. If it starts at negative one, what's stand going to do? This is an error. It's going to not run. So when, we, when we're building this code, we just have to be, ex I'm being extra careful to make sure that I'm setting up stand so that I am guaranteeing myself it's running only on the observed data and not the missing as well. Right? Because, as you might expect, I have experience in making mistakes about this before in my life. It's kind of embarrassing. You, you mean you ran that on missing data? Anyway. All right, so going back to the slides, I think I just described that. So what am I telling Stan? For an item, I'm giving it this observed vector. I'm highlighting just the first item, and I'm giving it one through the number observed for it. So the very first item, this would be the first row. I have to transpose the vector to put it into to stand. And this right here would be case one through 176. So what that is telling me is observed. It tell, it'll give me the string of numbers two through 177. Those are all the observed cases for the first item. And then y, we've only selected the observed data. Yes? Can you repeat why are we using the Chudesky function? Uh, I'm doing this just to show you how to build it in a general sense. We don't need the Chileski function. The Chileski function for a one by one matrix is just the number one. So the matrix is always going to be fixed to one. So we don't need it. Could we use theta uh, normal distribution? The standard yeah, we could. We could. We could. I just grabbed. I, I had code to pick from, and I went with the most degree of difficulty code I felt like to show you how to do that. Um, but you can take the simpler unidimensional code and do that as well. Now, there's another part of this, though. When I select only the observed cases in the part in pink, there are 176 of those for the first item. But there are 177 thetas. So we have to go and restrict the number of thetas so that it's the same size as well. So remember, we have the theta matrix. We have to put in and select only the observations that were observed, their theta values, to apply to this calculation, right? Otherwise, if we didn't do that, the right-hand side would have 177 calculations because theta is observed. Theta, we have a theta for every person. Even if they didn't give us this first item, we have a theta. It's a parameter. But we'll only have 176 on the, the left-hand side. And if those don't match, Stan will break, give us an error. So 
any of the predictors we have, we have to select the data for. Any of the person variables we have to select the data for. How are we doing with all that? Any questions? I'll keep going. But if you have questions, come back to it. Uh, so in the data sense, we have um, our observed array right here. I think I put one too many dimensions on here. I just need it to be two dimensions. Goodness gracious. My, my mother-in-law would say that. Just nod to Marcy. Yeah. My code is right in my code, but wrong in my slides. All right. So this part that's highlighted here shouldn't be there. I'll fix the slides later. Okay. Anyway, observed. This observed is just the same size as our data matrix. We do that because if everybody gave us data, we'd fill that with the indexes for it. All right. Uh, I just mentioned all of this. Here's the, uh, the, the non-missing array once again. I did the loop again. This is just showing you the very first item observed. This is the set of values, right? So what we need to tell Stan is take case two through case 177 to select the data for. And that's array indexing. And then finally, um, change missing NA values to nonsense. That's what I basically said. Um, the other thing I'll note, if you are using the data in some step in STAN, like in PPMC, if you wanted to calculate a variable mean, using a nonsense value will not, it, it will use that. You have to select only the cases to do the, the variable mean as well too. You won't be able to just take the mean of the variable. You have to take the mean of just the observed variables to make that work. Questions? Super exciting, yeah. Are you relating that to the order of logics? So you have a note that you can use the negative ones? Yeah, I'm picking negative one here because it can't be used with ordered logit. So that would tell me, Stan would tell me if it broke. If you're using normal, normal can take any, or any type of continuous distribution, there is no number that is not there. I would pick a number that would be far outside of the bounds of what you end up doing. Like if you have, if it's, if it's quantitative data and it's well away from zero, just put a zero in or something like that. But just something to, to offset it so much that if, it, if, it, if you accidentally give it, the results are so weird or wonky that you would be like, there's something wrong here. That's basically it. You don't want to like, for missing data that you have to go fill in that you don't want to be part of the model, you really, really want to make sure that it's not part of the model. <laughs> That's the main thing. So now we have to like M plus. Yeah, in M plus you can select what the missing values are, missing equals or miss whatever. Missing is, missing are, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> the terms they use is and are instead of equals drive me crazy. But yes, um, M plus. When you do that in M plus, they will also index just the values that are observed so that it knows which one to use as well. Other questions? Okay, um, as you'll note, Stan will run. Oh, I just did that wrong. We'll have results, ta-da. And everything is great. It works. So, the joke about this is, how do you work with missing data in Stan? You don't, just skip it. That seems really naive, right? The first, the first comment I gave you, well, do you remember what, whenever you asked, I think at Cass, you might have asked, the answer was don't, just don't have missing data. And now we're basically doing that still. We're just being like, yeah, just tell Stan that you have, a, tell Stan which is not missing and it's fine. Does that seem a little um, arbitrary? What's the right word? Yeah, you know, just like what is the mathematical ramification of that? Is what I'd like to ask you. What do you think that does? Let's talk about it. <laughs> Likelihoods with missing data. Turns out uh, we've skipped over the cases that we're missing. Right? 
So our likely, likelihood functions are slightly different. All right, remember for an item i, the model data likelihood for any of the parameters is the product across all people of the density of their observed response conditional on their parameters or their thetas or whatever else you want to condition it on, right? So you think about it. What does this mean? For our ordered logistic, we're in the, the greater response model, we have to come up with the probability someone's item response was actually what they give conditional on their theta value and the item parameters for it, right? And the likelihood, not log likelihood, but the likelihood is the product of all these terms across all people, right? We often work with a log. If we took the log of this thing, it would just be the sum of the log of that function, okay? By skipping the missing data, it's effectively like saying we now have a piecewise function for the likelihood. If we observe the likelihood, use it. And if we did not observe the, I'm sorry, if we observe the data, use the likelihood. And if we did not observe the data, put the value one in. Because that still looks like it's there. It's just the value of one, right? Um, this also applies to the person likelihood as well, too. If, if a person, when we go and look at that first person's theta, we'll need to put a one in that step. The, alternatively, you would just, you could change the, the product across the people that you have there. Well, it turns out that process itself uh, meets the, the definition or the assumptions of something, or better yet, this is the right process to use if you are, have data that is missing at random, that designation. Now, I have, don't have enough time to teach you missing data designations, and there's quite a few of them, and missing at random is a big, a big one. What missing at random data mean is that missing data are related to some type, something of the observed data, usually through a function in the model. In our model, think of person one. We just made person one's first observation missing. But we know that the data, you know, conditional on theta, the observations are independent. But the other observations we can use to get a theta, right? And that unconditional on theta, we know that this person's observations are likely related to their other observations overall. So the idea of missing at random fits, or this process, fits with the assumption of missing at random. It's basically what we call list-wise deletion. We're just taking out the cases that are missing. Um, now, this is a stronger method of, uh, a stronger method for analysis, or a, a, a more, uh, a sort of a, a more general assumption than you, what you would get if you did the opposite, which is where I jokingly said, oh, just don't have missing data. Reduce your data to only those that have observed. Reduce all cases. Right? If I use case-wise deletion, if I just took that very first person's all their data out, that last part, case-wise deletion, that is an assumption or the, the assumption that works with that using our full likelihood, something called missing completely at random, right? Which means the missing process has nothing to do with any of the data or the model that you have. That is very unlikely to hold in a lot of our, our settings. And so when it doesn't hold, you can show that there's a bias to the parameters. You've basically taken out people that should be giving you information. And they did, like if I think of my data where that first person just didn't provide a response to the first item, but then nine others there's a response to, that's important data to have. I, I should use it. So that's what this is. Turns out what this is doing is mirroring the likelihoods that you have in maximum likelihood. I mentioned before, the model data likelihoods are the same in Bayes and ML, right? They're, they look a little bit different from a notation point of view, particularly from the left-hand side, what's conditional on what. But our model data likelihood here is the same when we skip data as what would happen in an ML algorithm when we skip data as well. In ML algorithms, the log likelihood avoids the missing. It's just calculated with the cases that you have observed. That's it. It's, it sounds ridiculously simple. <coughs> it kind of is. It's more of a record keeping thing than a mathematical thing, like just making sure you know it. Yeah. So does this affect estimating the theta or the factor score? I mean, yeah. for a single person, for a definite number of theta, yes. we estimated what like 
nine items, other person could be a thing that wants three items or so? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What will happen there is that the, each person's uh, theta may be different. Like if you, if, like particularly in this case where I deleted one of the observations. Yeah. If I go back and look at this person's theta now, depending on where they're, what their pattern, if, if this data is a little weird because everybody answered no to most of the questions, right? But um, what you will see is the location of the theta might change, like the actual point estimate or the EAP estimate. And certainly the posterior standard deviation will change. It's because the fewer data points you have, the less certainty you will have about a person's theta estimate. Similarly, if you have some items where you have all the responses, and some items where you have a tenth, 10% 10 of those responses, the same thing will happen to those item parameters. The point estimates may change, um, but also the, um, the standard errors will be much wider because you don't have a lot of information. The model data likelihood does not have as many cases in it. So the contribution of it is much smaller. But it all goes back to this likelihood itself. You can think of the capital P is changing, number of people changing on an item. So you don't have that big of a contribution potentially for it. That's a very good question. So yes, missing data. Um, it's an interesting, other, the other part that's interesting about this, I don't have a slide on this, but let's talk about it. In achievement testing in education, because many of you are doing that. Not all of you, many of you. We don't have missing data because if you, miss, if you just skip a response, what do we do for you? We say, oh, you got it wrong. It's either correct or not, right? But it brings up an interesting question. Should we be doing that? I don't know. Are there ways of modeling the missing data? Yes, there are, right? You can think about it. Um, I made this comment to a co-author of mine, and they, they wrote a paper and did it, actually. It gave me a thank you, I think, in the, con uh, the acknowledgments. But um, I said, well, you know, if you think about it, if you have like a greater response item like we have, you have categories one, two, three, four, five in order. Missing could just be another category, but maybe it's not ordered. So you have like a nominal response for missing versus the ordered, and then graded for all the others. And she did it. She she coded it. There are ways of incorporating it. Because then now you've got the probability someone gives you missing as a category, conditional on theta. So there are ways that you can incorporate missing into your data where it doesn't give it full credit or whatever you want to call it. Remember, the score, the category itself of our items are not being used in the scoring process. That, like the numeric value, a zero or a one, <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five. The numeric values aren't being used. It's which category is being used. Right. Questions? This is exactly it. I, I agree with that, right? <laughs> like, we should use that. I mean, think of it, like, if we treated this as a nominal response item, we'd have, they pick, you know, option one, two, three, four, five, or they didn't pick an option. Well, that's like the sixth option, right? Yeah. We could use that. So, anyway. Okay. Other thoughts or questions? So that's missing data. That was a quick lecture. Right. What do you think? Can you do it? Good luck. No, just kidding. I say that because, like, I give you a lecture. Do you know how long it took me to get the stand code right for me to give you the lecture? And then your data is going to be different than that. It's going to be a while, right? So just, I try to make it as straightforward as possible. It seldom is. There's usually some catch that doesn't quite go your way. OK. Do you want to start the other lecture then? Let's do that. Goodbye, missing data. For the sake of our final projects, do yeah. we need to deal with missing data? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah. You keep telling me that, and I'm concerned. <laughs> I believe in you. You know more than you realize. And actually, once you get the hardest part is figuring out how to tabulate who's missing. When you have that, there's two parts of code that you change once you get it into Stan. Right? It's, it's the part that's the outcome and the part that this the predictors. So, yes? Yeah, so we will be using the entire data set. Item parameters will be computed based on the effective item responses. 
And person parameters will be computed based on effective item responsive tool. That's right. We are not deleting, deleting anything. We're not deleting any anything, no. We use the data set, we just do not use do not factor the missing responses into the calculation of either the item parameters or the person parameters either. Yeah, yeah it's funny when I so I like you, I you know, we don't have a I I volunteer to give a missing data class, maybe I'll give it sometime, but probably not while you are students. So but that being said, um, I didn't have a class when I was in grad school either. And I was I was working on this on the code side, right? I'm coding an algorithm in Bayes to do this, and they're like, we have missing data. And so before I looked at books, I'm like, well, I can solve this. I'm not using it. I'm going to skip it. And then come to find out, when I started reading the, the books or the papers on missing data, I'm like, hey, that's how everybody does it. All right. <laughs> it's like one of the cases where it's like, like the way to make it work code-wise actually syncs up with the way we make it work like philosophically too. So um, it sounds kind of ridiculous. It just don't have missing data. And truly, that's what we're doing. We're just not, we just don't have missing data. Yeah. Uh, finally, if, if the outcome is continued, do we have to choose like a rare number or what? Yeah, I just, what I would do if the outcomes continues, if we use like a normal distribution, you know, any number on the number line, negative or positive, you can use. I'd look at, but our data most likely doesn't follow the number line, right? whatever quantitative number you have there. So I pick a number that's obviously not part of it. I try to pick a very far outlying number away from where the density of the data is for two reasons. Number one, if by mistake I do model it that way, it's probably gonna have an influence on the results. So if I, if I make a mistake, I'm gonna look at that item, like the item, like the factor loadings or the, uh, the item intercept in particular in the, the normal distribution. It will be very big or very small with an outlying case. But that's the key. Make it very outlying. Yeah. Um, so to clarify, we were just using, utilizing one stand block. Because I think last we spoke, <laughs> yes. I was envisioning two. And so is that only for a case in which we need to impute values? Yes. If you wanted to impute values, you'll need a different stand block. Okay. Um, the missing then becomes is transform parameters is where it will be. The problem with transform parameters is you can't use integer values in transform parameters. So what do I mean by that? If I, did I kill off R? I killed off R. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. I, it's not your fault. I'm, uh, I, I'm getting a little excited to be like, it's done, but let me just go here. Okay, so ordered logistic needs an integer. You put an integer in the transform parameters block, it throws an error because you can't have integers as transform parameters. So, I haven't quite figured out what to do with that if you're using order logistic. <laughs> I was thinking of a couple workarounds, right? Um, could you not code it as, uh, instead of using the, so I'm gonna show you in the model fit part, there's an ordered logistic random number generator that will generate random numbers that are also integers. But could you just mirror that with a, you know, just code your own graded response function and generate the data as a non-integer value, right? It'll still be a category, it'll just be a real number, a floating point. And then the question I was looking into answering in Stan is, is there a integer to real conversion or the other way around, a real number to integer conversion? So if you think about it like an R, of course, I killed that off too. Let me grab the next lecture, just a moment. In R, if I say x equals 1.2, uh, x is numeric. But I can do the as.integer function and convert it to an integer now. And if, if x were not 1.2, it was just 1.0, it's numeric. I can switch it to an integer, and if I do class of that, it's now an integer. This is what we call a type conversion in the coding world. Um, so I was hoping to be able to find a type conversion, although I'm not sure. The other version of this, if you have a, I'm 
blanking on your data for your specific project, but if you have, if you're using the normal distribution, if you're using the CFA assumptions, you should be able to generate and model missing data. It's the categorical that's the problem. Okay. A mess, right? So there's part of results may be theoretical, <laughs> I guess. In the yes, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Okay. No, actually, what I really want you to do is to go, and because Stan's all open source, just go code Stan to let us use the missing values as integers. What's wrong? I mean, <laughs> please, just <laughs> put that in. No. Um, Here's my perspective, right? We're getting toward close to the end of the semester. I want you to try on your project. You can identify where it doesn't fully complete, but you gotta make it work at some point. And so making it work partially is better than not making it work at all, and that's what I'm expecting. Okay? Okay. Okay. All right, other questions? So to summarize, just don't use missing data. Because Stan doesn't. You just have to, you have to work with SAN to make sure it really isn't using the missing data. Uh, all right, should we talk about empirical priors? Is that next? Sound good? What is an empirical prior? Does anybody remember? How many of you have taken the multi-level class? What's a random intercept? Better yet, what do we say the distribution of the random intercept calls? Normal. Normal. That's a prior. Wow, you were Bayesian in multi-level, you didn't even know that. What's the mean of the normal distribution of the random intercept? Fixed at zero. So that's not empirical. What's the variance of that normal distribution? Not the random intercept. You estimate it. That's what an empirical prior is. An empirical prior is a prior where the hyper, one or more of the hyperparameters is estimated. Right? Now imagine what would happen for Han if we had used a normal prior with variance of one. The random intercept scale is on the scale of the data. If that scale of the data, if that variance or whatever isn't one, we might severely bias what we're doing with the random intercept in general. So in the multi-level sense, using random intercepts is imperative because we don't necessarily know the, score, the, the scale or the variance component for it. When measurement models, it's a little bit different, right? Because the measurement models, we control the predictors. The outcomes we don't control, we, well, I guess, Technically, if you're building a survey or an assessment or whatever, you control that too. But let's imagine you're like me and someone gives you your data and they're all liquid items like we have here, right? We don't control that, but we control the predictor for it. But what we're gonna talk about here, again, we're gonna go back to CFA for this. Not because I think you should be using CFA for these data but because when we start talking about empirical priors, we run up against some identification conditions sometimes. And those identification conditions are easier to see in their CFA. There's math that we can derive to show it, although I probably won't show you that. Um, those identification conditions still hold when we're not using the normal assumption. However, it's harder to show mathematically because we have to integrate and all the other things that go with it, and that's a mess, okay? How are we doing? So. We're also going to use a single latent variable as well. So again, this is the very first psychometric model I was talking about in class. Every item, uh, we have theta, which we'll fo follow, call normally distributed. We'll keep it standardized. The mean is zero, variance of one. We have outcome y. It's continuous, though we, we're pretending it's continuous. We still have our discrete data. And we have error, which also is normally distributed. An error has a unique variance psi squared. So empirical priors are ones where we try to estimate one or more of the parameters of the prior distribution. So for instance, 
our loadings, our factor loadings up to this point, I used, because Stan defines it with standard deviations, I used a variance of 1,000, a normal distribution with a mean of zero variance of 1,000, right? So what I called an uninformative prior, right, because a big variance. Same thing with the um, item intercepts. Previously, we used mean of zero variance of 1,000. But there's nothing stopping us from actually estimating the mean and variance of these parameters. What do I mean by that? Think of it this way. We have 10 factor loadings, right? So let's just pretend that we're gonna jump inside the Markov chain. That is the geekiest thing I think I've ever <laughs> freaking said. All right, let's just imagine we're part of the matrix. No, that's even worse. Um, that was like my grad school. Matrix came out in like 1999 and I'm like, oh, this is perfect for learning matrix algebra. Now it's like, no, this is perfect for showing you're an old man. All right, seriously, right? It happens to all of us who survive. Anyway, the survivor's benefit is you're out of touch. The, um, we have 10 factor loadings. We jump into Stan. Stan assigns a random value for each to begin with. There's 10 of them though. So there's nothing stopping us from saying, oh, we can go and estimate the mean of our factor loadings, right? Because there's 10. Like you need, technically you need one observation to get a mean, better with two, right? <laughs> Same thing with the standard deviation. We have 10 observations, we have 10 factor loadings. We could calculate the standard deviation of it. So what we could do instead of saying the mean is zero, and the variance is 1,000, we could say, no, no, no. The mean is the mean of our factor loadings. And the standard deviation <coughs> is the standard deviation of our factor loadings. This is an identified model. It will run. It will work. So long as the theta, the, the latent variable, is not empirical, this works. Have you seen this before? Because the Stan user manual is full of it. <laughs> Just put it that way. This is like the, the, the fun that Bayesians love. I mean, <coughs> I, I talk about the Bayesians like I'm not one of them. I'm like, I'm like the, uh, the Bayesian that's on the edge of the Bayes, right? I'm like the edge Bayes guy. Yeah, I'll go see Bayes' grave, but I don't go with the empirical priors. But here we go. We can go and specify and estimate the mean and variance of each of these. Now, get this, though. Each of these is now a model parameter. What do we need for our model parameters to, to specify them? The model data likelihood is actually formed by our parameter. So we're using our estimated lambdas as the model data likelihood. We also need a prior distribution for these parameters. So now we have a lambda parameter it has a prior with a mean and the variance. We're going to estimate that mean and variance, but those mean and variances are also going to have priors. Where does it stop? Seriously, right? So we have empirical priors that we could use. This is an empirical prior. First of all, what are your thoughts? Do you think this is a good idea? Bad idea? Yeah. What about generalizing with the results as this is depending on the data itself. So how can we say this works with other data compared to this? Um, so two things on that. The first is this is still a prior distribution. So the contribution of a prior with respect to the item parameter can be limited if you have a lot of data. So we have 170, so, so let's think about what the, the model data likelihood, the length of the data going into each, right? For each lambda, because there's one per item, we have 177 observations. Not the missing from the last time, but the 177 observations, right? And then those 177 observations likelihoods, we multiply that by this one likelihood. So in many ways, it's one to 177, depending on you know, this now, if we have something that's a very close to zero number, it's going to make it hard. So where you can say the empirical prior may not hurt you, 
is when you have a lot of data, because it's just prior, right? It may be an easy guess to start with. But I have a, but let's, let's keep talking about that though, right? Because general, generalization could be an issue, potentially, but there's other issues too. Uh, generalization happens to any model we run, but there, there may be some very specific psychometric issues that we get into with this. If, you, if we set like a prior as a normal for, for such type of data for the scale or so, so we are all on the same base, so we can compare results as, as this, but this we are specifying, specifying prior specific to our data, so it depends. My data has a prior, your data has another prior. Yeah, we could run into issues with that. Yeah. And actually, that's the other thing. Picking priors, one of the other things could be, you know, if I transform some of my parameters, right? If I wanted to um, come up with the predicted value, right, of y. Well, the predicted value is going to depend on lambda. And if I use a different prior, my posterior distribution of lambda is going to be different than yours, and so our predicted values may be different, right? So there may be, there may be values or changes to what we do that are ramifications of, not use, of using certain types of priors, certainly. Um, what, what else? Yeah? How can we control the information for the inside parameters? Because we saw that we can get informally over time and informally Well. <laughs> so remember, the lambda doesn't directly come from the data. It comes from the model for the data. But how we control the information for mu and sigma, so remember now, if you're thinking of mu as a parameter, think of its data. Whereas lambda had 177 cases, mu is only using lambda for its data. And there's only 10. So how we can control the information is mu needs prior. And that prior we put on mu is likely to be much more informative than the prior we put on lambda for this uninformed if we were to compare, okay. right? So what ends up happening is the further you get away from the model data itself, right? We are using a parameter in the model and then having a prior on its hyperparameters. So we're, we're like two stages away from the data the less data we have to work with, right? This mu for lambda has 10 observations, whereas lambda, which is a parameter, has 177 observations. So any prior we put on it is going to not likely have a bigger impact, depending on what we, what we choose, of course. Right? But that's one way we can control the information. Yeah? So it will work as a hierarchy? This is a hierarchical Bayesian model, another way of putting it. That's right. That's right. Yes? Oh, good. <laughs> um, they're talking about. There's some good people on there, by the way. I don't actually. Oh, yeah. I really like Stack Overflow, so I'm not actually. Look at the gold stuff. The yeah, gold absolutely. Stuff yeah. Um, Verified. They're talking <laughs> about like database priors violating the likelihood principle. So okay. maybe I have to talk about like the principle itself. Um. So people, I don't know about the principle. I don't. I don't know enough about it to talk about it. I don't think so. Okay. Um, part of the issue with it is. Um, whether or not certain likelihoods are invariant to certain transformations. Okay. And like you had mentioned, priors like this are not. But turns out priors like this are not also. There's very few priors that actually are invariant to transformations, meaning if you transform some of the model parameters, that the posterior distributions are identical. There's a set of priors that are called Jeffrey's priors. I don't know if you've heard of that before. A Jeffries prior uses the asymptotic version of what these things should be to calculate. So for instance, if we knew, well, it's easier to show in linear regression. Uh, each regression coefficient, we have a formula that we would say under ML what the standard error should be. So why don't we just use that formula as our prior? So every step of the chain, we're using it for our prior distribution. That's called a Jeffries prior. Those can be non-invariant, but they're also really hard to implement in a lot of cases. So, yeah. Is there a sort of bias that we have to be, right? Because like, without empirical priors, 
that's before we're seeing the data itself. Right. Our owner is there, and so if we're seeing the data, then we may have some influence. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, again, the, again, the think of, think of it this way though. Before you saw the reason why we would use an empirical prior is actually the opposite of that. Is that we have our data, but there's no way of knowing what lambda is for each variable, right? We know it's there. We don't know what it's going to be. So if we don't know what it's going to be, our choice of prior, where I'm saying all of them follow that, they may or may not be good for all of my items. And so what people think about with that is, okay, well, this removes me from having to put a choice of prior directly onto all of them that doesn't have some semblance of what I'm trying to get from the data themselves, right? Yep. That's the other thing. All of this, everything we're doing here, we, we'll, we judge by absolute fit and relative fit. And so if you pick a different set of priors, we can go and look at relative fit between our models. Uh, we both should look at absolute fit for both of them. But this is one of the fundamental issues in Bayes which has caused a lot of people a lot of consternation. For me, I'm not so worried about it, particularly on the item parameter side, um, although I don't recommend them at all. Actually, I don't use them. That's why I haven't taught you them to this point. But I want to talk, teach them because there's some craziness that goes on when we start talking about psychometrics. How about another thing? Think of what happens, what the prior is doing. Now, if we put an informative prior on, the, the prior distribution, I'm going to make a normal distribution with my hands here. Dangerous, right? right? What's it doing? A more informative prior has a more peak shape to it. And so parameters that are on the tails of the prior end up getting... Um, pushed toward the middle. Sometimes we call this shrinkage. They shrink towards the middle. So had I made this more informative for lambda, where is lambda going to go? It's going to be shrunken towards zero. Now this is where the psychometrician takes over, not the Bayesian. Right? What happens to our latent variable if the lambda goes closer to zero than it should be? Artificially because of the prior. Lambda governs how much information we have on about the, the latent variable, right? Technically speaking, it's not just lambda, it's the ratio of lambda squared over psi, that's the information function. But lambda is heavily involved in talking about the posterior standard deviation of theta. So from a psychometric point of view, if we're pushing lam lambdas towards zero, right, we will make it so that we believe we have less information about theta than we may have. Or another way of putting it, we would need more items to counteract the influence of prior, which to me is a great way of looking at it. I'd rather be conservative when we're making claims about people or students. Right? If this is a latent variable in an achievement test that we're selling, we're selling thetas, right? We need a certain level of reliability to sell our theta. I think it's better to make the data achieve it than to achieve it via a prior, right? If I had set the mean of this normal to be 10 and made it informative, guess what the posterior distribution of theta would look like all of a sudden? It'd be very narrow for each theta. That would be similar to saying, although not identical, that our, we have really high reliability. Look at how narrow our conditional standard error of measurement happens to be, right? To me, that's an easy way that you could lie about your assessment. I don't believe that should be a case. Now, take a look at the empirical prior. It could be the case that when we estimate the standard deviation of our lambdas, it's very small. So now lambdas are going to be forced toward the mean. And just like any other statistic, we know how the mean functions. Not all lambdas are going to be above or below the mean, right? If they're skewed, they might be, have a differential effect, but now we're shrinking them toward a value that's not zero, which to me means some of them will be shrunken too high. We'll put a, more information on some of the items. Now, some would be too low and some would be too high, depending on how the, the distribution of lambda works, right? You know, skewed distributions where the means fall and so forth, right? So one of the dangers in using an empirical prior if you don't have a lot of data is you could be in a psychometric sense, believing that you have more information about your latent variable that you don't necessarily have in the data itself. So that is why I don't recommend them for psychometric models. That's my 
It's my soapbox. What do you think? Anyway, too much. But I'll show you how to do it, okay? Questions? Have I lost you? By the way, kudos to all of you for being here listening to me. Thank you. It's December. It's the home stretch of class. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for this semester to be over with. And it's not because of you. I, actually, you're the highlight of my, my work life. However, thank you. Let me just say that. And I'm giving you all the intense topics now. Like, yeah, good luck. All right. So you'll note, I'm specifying empirical priors for lambda, mu, and psi. Those are the item parameters. I'm not including theta on this because if you put an empirical prior on theta, bad things are going to happen unless you worry about your model data likelihood. I'll tell you more about that Mon Wednesday. Why am I thinking we're meeting Monday? I don't, I don't Monday. I don't know what Monday is. But you're not meeting me Monday. All right. So I just mentioned all this. Um, there's several pitfalls of psychometric models. Not all model parameters can use empirical priors. That's one of them. Um, the use of such priors could be shrunken so that it makes it look like theta has more information than what's in data. Um, and more importantly, I think in this case, if you have like a CFA model, right? And you have one variable. Remember, lambda is an interesting thing. Actually, psi is too. How, heck, all of them are. The scale of y matters, right? In a linear model, remember back in linear models that we ran, the regression we ran, right? Lambda is our beta, right? It's our regression slope. That, and it, betas, the scale of beta is units of y per units of x. If you have wildly different units for y in our model, like you have one item, um, well, I'll just, I'll just mention, Cass, you know, the, the data we work with from our friends in the NSF project, one of those items we use a normal distribution for, it was the distance uh, in centimeters away from a point where they had to draw a line. Right? So they measured this distance. That's a completely different scale than the other parameters were on. So now all of a sudden that one item could go heavily influence the mean and variance of this, right? Because now that one lambda if I throw it on this empirical prior, it's going to skew all the lambdas. We might have one lambda that's really big just because of the scale of the, the units of the variable, not because it's more important. Well, guess what that's going to do to all of our other lambdas? Right? The mean has to be somewhere. It's going to, you know, the mean is, uh, if you think of robust statistics, the mean is, the breakdown point of the mean is one observation, right? You can have one observation skew the mean higher. The mean is going to be higher. Now we're going to push everything else higher. So it's really dangerous particularly if you're concerned about your latent variable estimates. It can be dangerous, at least that's how I look at it. I believe the other people who are my colleagues in Bayes, my friends in Bayes, if you will, um, may not believe it's as dangerous, but that's where I, I believe it to be. Okay, but I'm showing them to you because you might be like, hey, Templin didn't tell me about this. I didn't, avoid that. But I'm gonna tell you why. All right. So let's do this real quick and stand. Um, here's the model block. Basically, all of this is what we saw before, CFA. But now, for lambda, its mean is the mean lambda and the standard deviation parameter. Those are, those are two new parameters. And I have to give each of those a prior. So for the mean, I'm giving it a normal prior. <laughs> it has a hyperparameter. Now, I'm going to import the hyperparameter, I'm going to send it in as a piece of data. But I had to name it something, and I'm literally calling it mean lambda mean, which means it's the mean of the hyperparameter, mean hyperparameter for the mean of lambda. Seriously, mean lambda mean. And then I have mean lambda SD, which means it's the standard deviation hyperparameter for the mean lambda emp <laughs> empirical prior and so on and so on. Same thing with mu, uh, same thing with psi. Right? So you see the rate parameter here, I'm actually estimating it as well. But remember that rate parameter is a value that has to go be between zero and infinity. So I'm giving it also an exponential distribution to work with. No big deal, right? 
just a little exponential amongst friends. Something like that. I'm trying to like keep you on your toes. You'll never know what I'm going to say next. What BS is coming out of my mouth? All right. I say that a lot at my house. My, my son's like, Dad, what's BS? And it went through this with my daughter, too. And we defined it as beyond silly. It's not just silly. It's beyond silly. And that totally works. Oh, yeah, it's beyond silly. So he's going to run around the playground. Yeah, that's BS, Kale. Get in trouble. No, it doesn't mean that. It means beyond silly. Anyway. Oh, yeah. The Montessori kids, they love us. I will also add that my philosophy on words with him are, you know, no words are bad. They're just different uses that are bad. Sometimes, and that doesn't, that nuance, I have to admit, not great with the younger set, but it gives me the consistency I need to see girls older, so we won't be like, you lied to me, Dad. Yes, I lied to you. Yes, I did. But anyway. So, got all this. The parameters block now has um, the mean lambda, standard deviation lambda, the mean mu, the standard deviation mu, and the rate parameter all in it. Those are all new parameters to the model. And the data block is where I'm putting in the hyperparameters here. Mean lambda mean, means lambda SD, all that stuff. Now I will note I'm using a standard normal distribution for the mean of our, hyper, of our lambdas and a 0.1 um, rate parameter for the standard deviation. I'm doing that for both mu, mu and lambda, and I'm using a 0.1 rate parameter for the rate parameter. <laughs> anyway. The other thing I was going to note with this, there is a great connection, though, of empirical priors to multi-level models. And there are cases in psychometrics where you might see what we would call otherwise multi-level models. If we specify a lambda as following a normal distribution with a mean standard deviation, that's the same as saying we could, we could pre-parameterize that as taking lambda itself, adding to it the constant for the mean, and saying it has some error term with some standard deviation to it, the same standard deviation. Why I'm saying that is, if you've, heard, if you've ever heard of a, a field of psychometrics called explanatory atom response models, that's what they do. So here, we would be trying to predict an observation's lambda. We have an overall mean for it, but we might have other item level predictors for it. And then with the error component, they all come back together, together to give us the about original lambda itself. But basically, if we try to decide why a lambda parameter is bigger based on context of the items, that's what we could use it for. So, you want to see the results? Here we go. The mean of the factor loadings we estimated to be 1.87, and the standard deviations of the factor loadings was 2.41. That's kind of an informative prior, if you think about it. The mean of the item intercepts was 0.817, and the standard deviation of the item intercepts was 0.8008. One step. That's a really informative prior. And then our rate parameter for our size was 1.56. That's actually pretty informative also. So let's compare. I took the factor loadings from the lambdas from the uninformative prior, and I'm comparing it with the empirical prior. What stands out for you for these 10 values? You'll note the range of the axes are different, but I'd say those are fairly highly correlated. Not bad, right? And if I take the difference between them, you'll see this is, these are the ones that are, um, so I subtracted the uninformative from the informative. So anything positive means the uninformative is larger. Anything negative means the, um, the empirical prior is larger. So here, I would actually say that most, that it looks like there are seven lambdas where the uninformative um, prior had a higher value, and three where the empirical lambdas had a higher value. So that concern I had about over artificially inflating lambda may be overblown in this example. Now here's our posterior standard deviations for them. You will note here the um, the empirical prior is on the y-axis, the uninformative prior is on the x-axis. 
and let's just look at the difference. Now you can see a little bit more. The uninformed uh, lambda prior has a bigger standard deviation. So here, as we would expect, comparing the, the amount of information in our prior, the uninformed prior, which had a standard deviation of the square root of 1,000, has a bigger standard deviation, posterior standard deviation, than the empirical prior, which had a standard deviation that we estimated to be um, 0.0817. How's that work for you? Seeing these results, you're probably not all that concerned, right? It's not that bad. It changed a little bit. Same thing with, um, that's the standard deviation. All right, let's talk about mu. Again, uninformative on the x-axis, uh, empirical prior on the y-axis. They're very correlated. Um, here, most of the uninformative priors had a bigger value. So the empirical prior is bringing down the estimated values. Here's the standard deviations. They're roughly, actually again, three of them are below zero, but look at the value of these numbers. There's not a big difference in the standard deviations here for mu. So it's not, it's, it's having an impact, but not a whole big one. Here's also psi. Again, very highly correlated. The difference, um, a lot of the, the, so this is where one of these differences really matters. Um, two values were slightly lower than zero and the rest were slightly bigger than zero, but you see the scale, this is the hundredths place, right? So they're not that different. So, and here's our posterior standard deviations. Again, now we're in the thousandths location. So not a big difference. Surprising? How about theta? Theta from one, theta from the other. Roughly the same scale on the axes. I'd say pretty highly correlated. And now, what about our theta mean difference? Here, the empirical FETS prior, theta prior, <laughs> typo, um, is bigger than, gives us a, big, a bigger value for most thetas. And then the standard deviations for thetas Again, the empirical prior has bigger standard, now bigger standard deviations for theta. We're actually having less information about theta. But again, the, the values are, the differences are very small. We're in the hundredths place. So it's not very big. So I've got one minute left. I can do this. Can we use empirical priors for theta too? Heck, it's just adding parameters. The answer is no. Let me just show you the results. I did it. Here's my R hat, 1.6. Mean theta, standard deviation theta. Here's some plots for you. There's the mean of theta, there's the standard deviation for theta. That's some bad stuff going on there, right? So I thought, let me go in and try only an empirical prior for theta, only for theta. So I set all the values here, this should be a 0.1. And uh, got a little bit better, 1.23 was the R hat. And here are my chains. I don't like either of those chains. They don't look good, do they? So why do you think that is, in short? Actually, I'll just say it. Why that is, is because if, you, if you're in the SCM class right now, you know to estimate theta's variance, you need a marker item. What we're doing with Bayes is trying to identify the posterior distribution on the basis of a prior, where we really need what I'm going to call stronger identification. We need the model data likelihood to be identified. And that doesn't happen without constraints on the model data likelihood. And if you read the stand manual, their first IRT example estimates the mean of theta. But there's two features of it that are a little bit different. Number one, um, the, the values of the, um, the difficulty parameters have a very tight 0, 1 prior. And then later in the text, in one little sentence, says, well, you got to have a 0, 1 prior on the item parameters to make it work. Ah, right, because there's on Roche models in 1PL, you can identify it based on the difficulties, not the thetas. We're not in 1PL land here. But that's where we have to talk about. So that sets up Wednesday's class. And that's it.
Sorry to keep you one minute long, and I'm late for my next presentation. By the way, I'm talking at 2 p.m. downstairs. It's a bunch of nonsense. You have my permission to miss it. Thank you all for being here. Good to see you. Have a great weekend. Take care. Thank you to all online.